Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Whenever it comes to marketing or to business, what we tend to do is get this earth-shaking advice. It's almost like this earthquake that has to hit us and this massive tsunami that has to shake up our very being. But often it's the very little things that kind of get us moving and enable us to actually get things done. And this podcast, this episode, was about gentle productivity. It's something that I learned from my niece, Marsha, and we'll talk about Marsha in the podcast itself. So now on this podcast, I also talk about sleeping. And when I say sleep, I meant sleep in the middle of the day. And ever since we did this podcast, well, things have changed. I don't sleep so much in the daytime, but that's just because of some advice I got. However... I don't always take that advice. Sometimes I will just feel tired and I will go to sleep in the middle of the day and then my energy is restored. And these are the little things that you need to take advice on and then decide, okay, sometimes I'm going to have to do my own thing. What is this episode about? It's about gentle productivity. You're going to learn how to do the little things that make a massive difference. This is the three-month vacation, and I'm Sean D'Souza. I always assumed that you needed a nutcracker to open a walnut. Then I learned that you could easily use the rear end of a screwdriver, a couple of hard wax along the ridge, and the nut cracks open easily. To prove the point, I gave my niece Marsha the opportunity to crack open the nut. She's just 12 and her gentle taps were driving me crazy until I realized once again I was assuming erroneously. I found out that you don't need to whack the nut at all. A few Marsha taps and it opens just as effectively and without any splatter. This is the kind of learning we run into when we head into productivity. We assume that we have to do something great and wonderful to get productive. In reality, the changes needed are just Marsha taps. They're gentle, almost negligible changes that enable us to get a lot done with little or no effort. In fact, one of the greatest productivity tools is to do nothing. Intrigued? Well, follow along. As usual, we're going to cover three topics, and the topics are, first, working with a timer. The second is sleep. And the third is a focus on the road, not the destination. Let's start out with the first one, which is working with a timer. The Psychotactics article writing course is billed as the toughest writing course in the world. And rightly so. In fewer than 12 weeks, a participant has to go from a frozen state to being able to write an article exceedingly well. And when you look at all the components involved in article writing, you run into a mountain of elements to consider. That single course covers topics, subtopics, outlines, how to start an article, different types of formulas of writing, subheads, objections, examples, summary, sandwiching, and yes, the incredibly important task of starting an article, the first 50 words of the article. And in the process of juggling all of those components, the participant rapidly does one thing that jeopardizes the entire learning process. (music) 
the student will try to write an article that seems to meet his or her own standard. Now, the course requires that the student report back on their daily progress and learning every day. And so it's extremely common to see participants complain about the quality of their article. In past years, the way they dealt with this problem was to take several hours to write the article and then after that to edit the article. Now, no one wants to spend three or four hours writing an article, but invariably, that's how most people believe they get quality. In reality, all that is happening is a factor of exhaustion. That exhaustion factor is building up. And if you spend four hours writing an article today and four hours writing an article tomorrow, will you be awake on the day after? The chances are that you're just going through the motions as the tiredness seeps into your bones. When you're tired, you're not only robotic, but you miss out on some very important learning that would have instantly caused you to pay attention if you were better rested. So the answer, it lies in a timer. The article writing course runs to a timer. You have a fixed time to do the outlines, a fixed time to do your assignment, and yes, a fixed time to spend your time in the forum looking at the work of others in the group. When your time is up, you're done. But this doesn't make any sense at all. With a fixed time, would the quality not get a lot worse? After all, when you labor over your work, you get time to fix the glitches, you get time to tidy up the work, and you make it better. A student that is given just 90 minutes to write an article may be dissatisfied with his work, but give him 180 minutes and the article doesn't get 200% better. His work is probably improved by a mere 5 or 10%, but the exhaustion level, that goes sky high. And this is the problem. It drives you crazy. You get more and more tired. Tasks that have a fixed deadline may not seem like the best in the world, but they are the key to productivity. Now, I draw a daily diary of cartoons in watercolor. I'm fastidious about doing one watercolor every day, but then a big project comes along and suddenly I'm lost. I'll skip a day, which turns out to be a week, and soon a month has slipped by without any work being completed. What's worse is that I ache to do that watercolor every day. But hey, a watercolor takes me anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour, which is why I can't handle the watercolor when this big project rolls along. But what if I painted for just 15 minutes in a day? Instantly, I feel the need to rebel. I know that it takes 45 minutes, so how can I achieve something in 15 minutes? But I made the rules, so I might as well use it, right? And so I did. I did what I could in 15 minutes. Was it as good as the 45 minutes painting? Probably not, but that's what we found on the article writing course as well. At first, there's this intense sense of rebellion that goes through your brain. It goes, no, you can't do that. Yet the moment we realize there's no way out, the creative side seems to take over. And we work out how we can achieve that task in a shorter duration. Let me be very clear with you. I've slaved over a watercolor for five hours and it's not like the additional time makes for a better painting. Granted, there are going to be deficiencies in the final product, but if you keep up the speed every single day, something very interesting happens. You manage to put out some very good work in a fraction of the time. And most importantly, where there was a blank canvas, there's work. Not only did I do my painting, but I'm proud to have something instead of nothing. Instead of giving up, I'm moving ahead by putting a restriction on how much time I can allocate to the project. Amazingly, 
this has reflected in the dropout rate of the article writing course. When you call a course the toughest writing course in the world, it usually lives up to its billing. And at least 20% of the students drop out. Now, most other courses online have a dropout rate of 80%, maybe as high as 95%. Yet, once we put the timer in place, we see that the dropout rate goes down. Now, we're in week seven of the course as I'm doing this podcast, and only one student seems to be teetering. Will that student come back? We don't know for sure. But a lack of exhaustion is the key to productivity. It seems ridiculous to let a timer dictate your output, yet the timer works for our courses, for workshops, for our personal productivity, and even when Marsha is doing her school assignments. Given endless time, she fills in the time in some magical way. You put her on a timer and she astounds everyone, including herself. In trying to get more productive, we're looking for that super big tool that will change our lives. Instead, the first of those tools is the humble timer. You may go over time, but you'll finish your work quickly enough. Will it be amazingly good? No, it won't. But if you don't use the timer, nothing gets done, which is a lot worse. And that's the first gentle tool of productivity. So what's the second tool? You know this one well, don't you? It's called sleep. Sleep? How are you going to be productive when you sleep? Sleep helps us in many different ways, but we don't relate garbage disposal to sleep, do we? Lack of sleep affects brain function. It reduces learning. It impairs performance. It also seems to prevent us from transferring short-term memory to long-term memory. However, researcher Dr. Malkin Nidhagard, he has a mind-blowing theory, which he submitted as a paper to the prestigious journal called Science. His research shows that the brain apparently goes through a garbage clearance when we're asleep. Nethergaard's team showed that brain cells shrink during sleep. This opens up the gaps between neurons, which then allow fluids to wash the brain clean. They also suggest that failing to clear away some of those toxic proteins may play a role in brain disorders. But we're not interested in brain disorders right now. What's happening is this garbage keeps piling around your house. And yet when we look around, we have idiots that tell us that sleep is not a good idea. Everywhere you look, you have the so-called gurus berating you for dreaming about the weekend. Very few people seem to take breaks, let alone weekends. Vacations seem out of the question. But even sleep is treated with disdain. Sleep is associated with laziness, and there's a disdain for the afternoon siesta. In many countries, they use a derogatory term. They call it the nana nap. Yet, Nethergaard's pretty clear about the value of sleep and how it affects the clearing of junk from your brain. You can think of it as if you were having a house party, he says. You can either entertain the guests or you can clean up the house, but you can't really do both at the same time. Productivity is the house party. The more productive we are, the harder we work, and the greater amount of garbage we seem to accumulate. And boasting about little sleep is hardly the way to go about getting rid of the garbage. I know this sounds pretty ironic, seeing that I wake up at 4 a.m. every day, but I sleep early. I sleep 
before 10 p.m. And there's a solid hour or even two hours of sleep in the afternoon. And this regime of getting more sleep rather than less is what counts towards productivity. But what if you feel groggy after an afternoon sleep? Many people do. And it's a good thing to measure how much sleep is restorative and how much makes you feel groggy. Some people nap in sleep cycles. I've found that I can sleep for 45 minutes or 90 minute sleep cycles. If I'm woken up in between, like yesterday, then I feel groggy. But here's the really interesting bit. I sleep longer when I'm more rested. On work days, I can sleep for 45 to 90 minutes, but on vacation, I can sleep for three hours. Now, no one is asking you to sleep for three hours or even 45 minutes. You should try a 20 minute nap at the very least. Instead of trying to create yet another to-do list, your biggest item should be garbage clearance. On the Freakonomics radio show, Lauren Hale spoke about sleep. Lauren Hale is an associate professor of preventive medicine at Stony Brook's university, and she reckons that screens of any kind inhibit our sleep. Whether it's a phone, a tablet, computer, or TV, it's going to affect your sleep. Getting rid of all those devices at least 30 minutes before you sleep is one of the ways of getting a sounder sleep. Anyway, it stops us from checking email or looking at Facebook, which only increases the churn in our brain instead of letting us sleep well. Sleep may be on everyone's to-do list, but not on everyone's productivity list. We don't see sleep as important, and yet it's been amazingly useful when training clients in courses. In the 2008 version of the article writing course, for instance, clients needed to write five articles a week and there were no limits on time. They all turned out decent articles, but in the 2016 version of the article writing course, the clients are required to write two or three articles a week and there are limits on time. In every instance, the 2016 batch is writing far superior articles in smaller portions of time. And how do I know this to be true? A skill of writing can never be treated like an objective science and it's always going to be subjective. Yet I've written between 3,000 to 4,000 articles in the past 16 years. This includes 52 articles per year for the Psychotactics newsletter, 3 to 5 articles for 5,000 BC per week. It doesn't include several books, it doesn't include reports. And every article writing course generates between 800 to 1,000 articles. Seeing that I've conducted over 10 consecutive courses, that's about 10,000 articles read over the past 10 years. When you add it all up, we're looking at at least 14,000 articles over the past 16 years. Still makes it subjective, but I'd say I have a pretty good handle on what's good versus not so good in article writing. And the more rested the student, the better the articles. I'd like to say that writing more articles would make the client a better writer, but it doesn't. Not in the early stages at least. Once they've got a good handle on the elements of article writing, they write quickly, they create less garbage, and they're able to write every day if necessary. Even so, sleep helps tremendously, which is why weekends and breaks, and yes, vacations are very crucial. This improvement in productivity doesn't need a team of researchers, does it? It's not just a finding when it comes to article writing. You know from your own experience how much better you feel when you've had a good night's sleep. Yet knowing that it helps with removing all the garbage 
that's a completely different perspective. Now you can sleep a lot more and contribute to your productivity. This brings us to the end of the second part on sleep and takes us to the third part, where we focus on the road, not the destination. Most of us are told to start with the end in mind, the goal, the destination, the dream. And it's that end point that more often than not unravels our entire sequence of productivity. The end point is why we get involved with any undertaking. We join a cartooning course to learn how to draw cartoons. We go into karate class so that we can protect ourselves should we find ourselves in a bit of a bother. And yet for most of us, that end point is pretty fuzzy. What would the cartoon you draw in six months from now look like? What kind of moves would you make in karate a year from now? No one can answer that question, no matter how much you predict the future. So the end point is important, but in reality, it's just a point in the road. A better way to look at the end point is to visualize the drive to your weekend picnic spot. Now, you clearly know your destination, but as you get in the car and you get going, what are you looking at? Yes, it's the road right in front of you. Every turn of the wheel continues to get you to focus not on the end point, but on the process. Productivity involves more process than end point. The journey is the benchmark. So if we were learning how to write a sales page, we wouldn't be focused on the end point. We'd be intent on managing the process. If you're learning to write headlines, you focus on the headlines. If you're learning to write bullets and features and benefits, they're all part of the sales page. They're all part of the journey. But you should never ask, how is my sales letter doing? That's the wrong question to ask. Instead, you should say, am I benchmarking what I learned today? Am I benchmarking what I learned this week? The moment we're focused on the endpoint, we come up with rather silly statements like, my work isn't up to the quality I expected. And the reason for the seeming failure is you're evaluating the entire project and you're not there yet. So frustration sets in and then you end up berating yourself, thinking that everyone is better than you. And can you believe being productive when your mental state is in such a shambles? The way to approach productivity is to break up your journey into smaller bits. When clients write an article, I advise them to do the outline first. Then to do nothing for hours on end. After those hours have ticked away, write the first 50 or 100 words of your article. That article gets billed until a day, even two days have passed. But how much time has the client spent on their article? Often, it's just little over two hours. Yet, how do many writers attack an article? They sit down and they try to do what I used to do. I'd be adamant about getting to the end point, so I'd spend all day with the article. As the hours ticked away, I'd get so lost that most of the articles never made it to the finish line. Instead, I throw yet another article into my article writing graveyard. What seemed like a good idea, the finish line, was in reality a terrible mistake. I lost energy, I didn't work with the timer, I didn't have the nerve to take a nap to replenish that energy. And so the article never did make it to the finish line. Well, most of the time, it failed. I was trying to be productive, but I ended up doing quite the opposite. The gentle side of productivity is to focus on what's right ahead of you. And here's what Bob Bowman, who is the coach of Michael Phelps, who's one of the most decorated Olympian of all times, 
Here's what he would say. They value the process of success more than any particular outcome. I think if I had to say my coaching philosophy, that's it. The process is more important than the outcome. Because that's what is controllable, and that's what's within our ability to deal with. The outcomes are largely dependent on what other people do. I think Nick Saban, coach at Alabama, he has a really good saying. He says, don't look at the scoreboard, play the next play. And that's what we try to do when we're swimming. We don't worry about what's going to happen at the end or what place we're going to get. We worry about how we're going to do the first turn. So champions value the process of success more than any outcome. Because that's what's controllable. That's within your ability. If you want to see gentle change, you need to focus on the road right in front of you. The end point, that's just a point. There are points all along the road. No one point is more important than the next. If you manage to get to 70% of the end point, it's still better than dropping out. And since productivity is about getting things done, 70% is a lot better than nothing. And this brings us to the end of this podcast. So what did we cover today? As usual, we covered three things. The first thing that we worked on was working with the timer. Now, I didn't believe that this would work out as well as it did, but we tried it out for courses where people have very little time and they have a big task in front of them and it works amazingly well. The more time we're given, the more junk we start to accumulate, the more we start to edit and fix and refix, and it's terrible. And you should see this when people do watercolors, they go over and over again, and then it's muddy and terrible, but you just have a limited time, and it's amazing. So, timer. It takes enormous amount of effort to put a timer in front of you and there is software online, and you can get that software and turn it on when you sit at your computer. And when you don't sit at your computer, just turn on a timer. You're gonna resist it, but try it. Everyone on the course resisted it, and once they realized how much it helped them, they're now passionate about the timer. The second thing is sleep. You might think that watching TV is a good thing. You might think that reading is a good thing. But most of all, you need that sleep because it's about garbage clearance. And if you're not going to clear that garbage, it's going to stink up your brain and you're not going to function as well as you do. If you want to function at a very high capacity, Garbage needs to get out and gone from your brain. So work on that garbage disposal, that garbage clearance. And finally, the third and almost incredibly obvious thing is to focus on the road, not the destination. The destination is fine. We all need to have a destination in mind. But trying to get to the end point and judging our quality and saying that we're not good enough. Of course you're not good enough. You haven't reached your destination. You're still handling bits of that journey. And when you're handling bits of that journey, that's how it's going to be. It's not going to be that great quality. But you have your timer, you stop, and that's it. You focus on the road in front of you. That's all you need to do. Look at the road in front of you. And that'll get you further along until you reach your destination. The reason why people don't reach their destination is because they're always gauging how great they're supposed to be. Well, gauge how great you are right now. So what's the one thing that you can do today? The one thing you can do today is go to sleep. We all need our sleep. Go to sleep earlier. Switch off that TV earlier. Stop reading earlier. Go to sleep. Get a good night's sleep and see how productive you are the next morning.
And this brings us full circle to the Masha taps, which is that the gentle bits of productivity are what gets you ahead in life. And the reason I got involved in all this walnut business was because we went to the market on Sunday. We have this huge open Sunday market and I got a kilo of walnuts. So instead of going to the supermarket and buying these pre-peeled walnuts, I now got some activity that will keep me busy and I've got a really good screwdriver that helps me. So go and get yourself a bag of walnuts and a screwdriver and you're going to have some fun this weekend. So what's happening in psychotactics land? By the time you're listening to this podcast, we will have gone past Christmas and headed towards the new year. And I hope nothing is happening in psychotactics land. Absolutely nothing. That's me, Sean D'Souza, saying bye for now, and I'll see you in the new year. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.